Well, keep your Bibles open in 1 Samuel chapter 24 as we come to consider God's Word together this morning. Now, as many of you may know, my career before the Lord called me into the pastoral ministry was that of mechanical engineering. Uh, It was something in my blood from a a young age which resulted in me taking things apart just to to see how they worked, to see what was going on inside, and then hopefully succeeding in being able to put them back together again. And my real passion, particularly in high school and university, was that of building rockets. Uh, I loved designing rockets on the computer and then building them with friends and then hoping, hopefully getting to see them uh, take off to tremendous heights. Now, when I was growing up and having these engineering tendencies, I always wished that one day I could work for NASA and uh, hope to work on the space shuttle program and possibly even be a kind of a test pilot that would, would go uh, into space to, to fix stuff. But that was then, and this is now, and the space shuttle program uh, has come to an end. And and so young boys today with the same kind of engineering gene in their blood, they now aspire to new heights. And that is to be a presenter on the TV show Mythbusters. I mean, those guys just have the best job, don't they? They test all kinds of myths and and old wives' tales to see if there's any kind of scientific truth behind the myths. And the absolute best part of their job is that whether the myth is true or not, uh, inevitably the show ends with them blowing something up. Well, this morning I want us to take our cue from the Mythbusters as we put three modern myths to the test. But our methodology will will be to subject those myths to the truth of God's word as we find it contained in 1 Samuel 24 and then to see whether those myths stand up or not. Now we've read together this well-known story of David in the cave and, and Saul comes in to relieve himself. And instead of David killing Saul, he cuts off the corner of his robe and then presents himself to Saul as someone who is being unjustly hunted down and Saul weeps in sorrow for his wicked actions against David. But this story reveals the belief in three modern myths, lies of the evil one, deception, and it proves those myths to be false. And so as we work our way through the story this morning, we need to subject our understanding of these myths to the word of God. And perhaps for each of us here today, we are going to have at least one myth busted, but maybe even two or three. So let's start with myth number one. And myth number one says this, an open door is confirmation of God's will. Now, we looked at the whole topic of of guidance, you will recall, uh, last time, and we saw that God delights to guide his people by his Holy Spirit through the word of God, which leads us to live lives of godly wisdom. And we saw that the general way of guidance for us as Christians is through the wisdom of God, which is revealed to us through the pages of Scripture and then applied to our hearts and to our minds by the Holy Spirit. And you will recall that we we spent some time looking practically last week at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, to see how this works itself out in our lives. Romans 12 said, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. So there's God's manual, as it were, for biblical guidance. For you and I to really know the will of God in our lives, we need to offer our lives as a living sacrifice to God. We need to set ourselves apart for serving God in this world. We need to then 
on the negative side, not conform to the patterns of this world, to the philosophies and the teachings and the practices of this world. Instead, we need to commit ourselves to live lives of obedience to God's word. And then we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds as the Holy Spirit takes the study of God's word and he transforms us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, that all seems quite straightforward, doesn't it? I didn't say easy, uh, but it is straightforward. God guides us through wisdom principles of his word as they become the life principles by which we live. But there is another school of thought regarding guidance which has become very popular in today's Christianity, which, which says that God guides us through a series of spiritual markers or, or open doors, and when all the markers align, when all the doors open, then you will know that that is God's will for your life. Now those who like that understanding of guidance will refer to a verse like Colossians chapter 4 verse 3 in support of their theory. Colossians 4, 3 says, And pray for us that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. But what you will find if you go and look closely at Colossians is that Paul is not speaking here of personal guidance at all. He is asking the church to pray to God on his behalf that the message of the gospel will have an open door to be proclaimed, that there will be no hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. But if we are honest, I'm sure that most of us, if not all of us, have at least on one occasion or perhaps many more times uh, spoken of the doors which the Lord has opened and we have taken that as a confirmation of God's will in our lives to do whatever we chose to do. We usually say something like this, I prayed to the Lord about this or that and then the Lord opened the door, and so I went there, and I did that. Now, our myth that we want to test this morning is this. An open door is a confirmation of God's will. Well, let's look at verses 1 to 7 of our passage this morning. And we find that David and his men are hiding in the far recesses of one of the caves in the desert of Engedi. Saul is now back on his trail. He is in hot pursuit of David with 3,000 of Israel's finest and fittest soldiers. But even the best of soldiers, even the greatest of kings, needs to make a pit stop. And so Saul leaves his men and he goes into the cave to relieve himself. Of all the many caves in the desert region of Engedi, Saul chooses the very cave where David and his men are hiding. And David's men immediately latch onto the open door guidance policy. Look, David, they say, this is your chance. God has given Saul into your hands. This is an open door, Saul. Uh, uh, David, step out in faith and claim God's promise to you to become king. Walk through the open door. God's given it to you. He's flung it wide open. You will become king today. Now, notice something here in verse 4. And it's something that we are also very prone to do if we are not careful. And that is to take scripture out of context to make it say what we want it to say. Yes, of course, God had promised to David that he would become king. That's true, but God never said when. He never said that David should take this matter of kingship into his own hands. And so David's counselors took the word of God, the promises of God, and they twisted it in order to get David to do what they wanted him to do. You see, as far as they were concerned, if Saul was dead then David would become king, they would not have to live in caves anymore, and most of them would become David's new royal officials. 
So come on, David, this is the open door. It's a clear sign that God has handed Saul over to you today. Well, David creeps up on Saul in stealth mode and with one hand on the knife and perhaps the other hand around his nose, he cuts off the the corner of Saul's robe and then sneaks back to his men. But immediately after doing that, David is guilt struck with what he has done. And the question we need to ask is why? Why does David feel so guilty for having cut off the corner of Saul's robe? Well, the answer to that is because there is much more behind David's actions than we may realize at first glance. You see, the king's robe was a sign of his special office, of his special anointing and appointing by God to be the king. Remember what they did to Jesus in his mock trial after they had arrested him. They they put a purple robe on him, a royal kingly robe, and then they mocked him as a fake king. See, the king's robe was synonymous with his office. And so by David cutting off the corner of King Saul's robe, he was basically declaring that he was coming to, to come and dethrone Saul, take the kingdom away from Saul. You might remember earlier in 1 Samuel that Saul had ripped the coat of Samuel and Samuel used that moment as a, as a prophecy that the kingdom would one day be ripped away from Saul. And, and David knew this and this act of, of cutting the robe was a sign of, of raising his hand against the Lord's anointed. It was basically an act of David saying to Saul, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to take away your kingdom. Well, David's conscience is stricken by what he has done. And he confesses this to his men. Look at verse 6. He said to his men, as the Lord is my witness, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. I will never lift my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. And with these words, David persuaded his men and did not let them rise up against Saul. And then Saul left the cave and went on his way. So what do we see here regarding our myth this morning? Myth number one. How does our myth stand up against the word of God in these verses? Well, what we see is that an open door is not necessarily a confirmation of anything. It's certainly not necessarily a confirmation that it is God's will to do something. It may simply be a test of our faith not to walk through that door. Now the question then is, well, how do you know if an open door is confirmation or a test? Well, you need to go back to what we looked at last week in God's word about guidance. You need wisdom to make that call. Wisdom which God gives to every one of his children who reads his word and who is transformed by the renewing of the Holy Spirit to see and know and understand the will of God. So what we see is that David had to take this open door, which would have resulted in the very promises of God being fulfilled, and he had to shut the door. Why? Because of the wisdom that he had learned from the rest of God's word, from the principles in God's word. David had to resist taking the shortcut because his knowledge of the word of God led him to follow a higher principle. David was following the command here to love your enemies, to do good to those who persecute you. Although this was probably before these words were written, David understood the principle of Proverbs 25 verse 21, which says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Another wonderful example of of this same principle is seen in the book of Jonah. Uh, You will recall where Jonah is fleeing in disobedience from God's direct command, God's command to go to Nineveh. And Jonah decides to run in the opposite direction. And so he heads down to the port of Joppa. 
And what does he find when he enters the port town of Joppa? He finds the open door of opportunity. There's a ship just about to leave. And guess what? There's space on board for Jonah. In Jonah's case, we see that an open door of misguidance led Jonah down a terribly dark path. And so I think as we consider this first myth this morning about open doors being a confirmation of God's will, we must come to the word of God and say that this myth is busted. Open doors are simply opportunities for you and I to seek the wisdom of God to act in accordance with his good, pleasing, and perfect will, which may mean that the right thing to do is to get up, to walk to the open door, and to shut it. So let's move on then to myth number two this morning. Myth number two is this. It's my job to vindicate myself against my enemies. Now, this myth is a, a little bit more difficult than the first myth because it, it scratches where most of us itch. This myth affects my identity. It affects who people think I am. It affects their perception of me. And we live in a day and age where, where our rights have been elevated to the status of untouchable. No one dare cross us. No one dare say or do anything which, which impacts on my rights. And I'm ready to defend and I'm ready to do what it takes to reclaim what is rightfully mine. And this is especially true when the person who has offended me or the person who's sinned against me or said or done something to attack my character happens to also be my enemy. Surely it is my job to, to vindicate myself, to, to make sure that I clear my name at all costs so that my self-esteem and, and my image in the community and, and my recognition among my peers is restored to what I think it should be. And so the sad reality is that people don't even go to God's word at times like this to find out what God has to say to them in that situation. They, they just immediately respond with the same kind of mindset and thinking as the secular world. Haul out the guns and fire away at the enemy until they feel vindicated. The problem is that there is a very, very, very fine line between a rightful defense of our Christian character and integrity and revenge. And very often we will find that the motivation that many people have who've suffered wrong at the hands of others is not to clear their name so much as it is to make the other person pay. It's revenge. The motive is vindictive. And so you will find Christians hauling each other before the magistrate to insist on their rights. You will find Christian employers and employees battling it out in courts of arbitration until the last cent has been paid. You will find Christians stooping to the most sordid of, of gossips and, and rumors to try and vindicate themselves by smearing their enemies in as much dirt as they can dig up. And so I want us to test this myth against the word of God. Is it my job to vindicate myself against my enemies? Well, verse 8 to 15 shows us David's response to this very situation. He's been slandered. He's been robbed of his title, his home, his wife. He's a bit like those guys from the A-team who were hunted down and were undercover for a crime that they never committed. Surely the, the most pressing thing for David at this time would have been a desire to have his name vindicated, to reclaim his rights, to clear his name, to regain his reputation and his freedom. Well, the, the story takes a very different turn to, to what we would expect. David gets up and follows Saul out of the cave and addresses Saul as my Lord the King, and then bows down to the ground before him. 
What on earth was David thinking at this point to bow down in humility and respect before Saul? Well, we see what David was doing here, and it's very interesting, and it reveals to us the real attitude of his heart. David was bowing down before Saul because he was ultimately bowing down in humility and respect before God. See, David recognized that Saul, as wicked and corrupt as he was, was nevertheless the Lord's anointed, the Lord's appointed king. And although David was innocent and Saul was acting in a, in a most ungodly, wicked way, nevertheless, David was honoring God by honoring Saul. Now, the first part of David's speech does seem to indicate that David was looking to vindicate himself. And he comes out with, with all the facts which have bearing on their situation. But what you will see is his goal in verses 9 to 11 is simply to declare the truth. Honesty is always the best policy. To make the truth known and to bring out the facts of the situation into public light. This is good. This is what David did here. And, and this is usually what you and I are very good at too. We are very good and, and quick at conveying the facts of our innocence when we have been sinned against. And, and if that is the truth, then that is fine. But the difference is comes in with what happens next. After stating the facts, after declaring the truth of his innocence before Saul and his unjust persecution of David, David stops the bus at that point and he hands the matter over to God. He does not make any demands on Saul or any demands on the, the, the witnesses to this declaration. He states the truth and then he hands himself and the whole situation over to God. Look at verse 12. May the Lord judge between me and you and may the Lord take vengeance on you for me. But my hand will never be against you. Look at verse 15. May the Lord be judge and decide between you and me. May he take notice and plead my case and deliver me from you. See what David does? He uses the opportunity to firstly declare the truth of the matter to Saul and then he hands the matter over to God to vindicate him. He doesn't ask Saul to make any promises. He doesn't take Saul to the council for mediation and arbitration. He simply states the truth and then he hands the matter over to God for vindication and justice. Now, does that sit well with you this morning? Because I can picture some of you perhaps squirming in your couches this morning. Well, it doesn't sit well with me either. And do you, do you know why? Because Doing what David did at this point requires a complete and a total trust in the goodness and the character of God. It's to totally hand things over to God and there are very few of us who are good at doing that. Leaving the matter with God means that we have to step back at that point from our rights, from our desire for vindication and, and restoration. And it means that we trust God with all these things to do what he knows is best. Best for us, best for the other person who is sinned against us and ultimately best for the glory of his name. So let me ask you a few probing questions this morning. When you seek to vindicate yourself, whose interests do you have at heart? Of course, it's your own interests. Absolutely. And what about your enemies? Ah, uh, probably not. And what about God's interests? Well, maybe, as long as it doesn't get in the way of my own interests being met. But when we hand the matter over to God, God will always do what is best for you. 
He will do what is best for the other person who has sinned against you, and he will do what is best for the glory of his name. No questions asked. And that, my dear friends, requires complete, absolute faith in God. So myth number two says that it's my job to vindicate myself against my enemy. And the word of God reveals to us that it's not my job. It's not your job. It is God's job. Romans chapter 12 verse 19. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. Because it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Throughout the word of God, we see this principle that it is God's job to repay. It is God's job to punish. It is God's job to vindicate and defend those who are his children. And so we need to leave it up to him. And so myth number two is firmly busted. And so finally then, let's consider in the third place, myth number three, which is this. Sorrow over sin is a sign of true repentance. I don't know if you've noticed, but, but each one of these myths is getting closer and closer to the heart. And this final myth is certainly a matter of the heart. It's a matter between each individual and God. And it's this matter of repentance. And the truth about this myth is vital to discover because repentance is at the heart of the gospel. And so our salvation depends on a right understanding of this truth. The Bible makes it clear that faith and repentance go hand in hand with our salvation. Jesus came and he preached a gospel of repentance. The apostles responded to those who inquired about salvation and they said, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So what is repentance? Well, repentance is the recognition of the vileness of our sin and a, a repulsion and a hatred of it such that it drives us to Christ for salvation. It's a, a turning our back on, on everything that we once were, everything that we once loved, and it's a turning in the, in the opposite direction and a totally committing ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and His ways. And that is why you cannot be saved unless you have truly repented. Because it's only when you see yourself as God does spiritually dead, living in and, and loving your sins, your filthy, wicked sins, that you are helpless, that, that you can do nothing to save yourself. It's only then that you can turn your back on your own attempts to try and, and get right with God. And it's only then that you are able to turn to Jesus Christ by faith for his forgiveness and for his righteousness. And so because repentance is so closely tied up with true salvation, we can be sure that it is something which the devil will seek to do his utmost to deceive us in. And so we need to make very sure what God's word says on this topic. Now in verses 16 to 22, we see something which looks very sincere. As David confronts Saul with the truth. Saul realizes out in the open just how far he had fallen, just how wicked his actions really had been. Saul is exposed. His, his evil intentions have now become public. And we are told in verse 16 that he wept aloud. He was overcome with, with remorse for the way that he had acted towards David. And so Saul acknowledges David's righteousness. He acknowledges his own failings. He even acknowledges the promises of God that David would become king. And from all outward appearances, it truly looks like Saul has been converted here. He, he even asks David to make peace with him. It's, it's as if he's seen his sin. He's acknowledged his failure and he pleads with David. It seems for a 
kind of forgiveness. But something is missing. Something absolutely vital for true repentance is missing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. In other words, there is a kind of genuine, sincere, heartfelt sorrow which does not lead to salvation, but in the end it leads to death. And as we look at the scriptures and as we turn ahead to chapter 26, you will find that Saul is back on the trail of David once again out with 3,000 men to hunt him down to kill him. But how can that be? Saul seems so genuinely sorry in our passage, genuinely grief struck. But it was not a godly sorrow which led to repentance. We can't be sure, but it seems like it was the sorrow of being caught out. It was the sorrow of being publicly exposed. It was the sorrow of recognizing his own miserable state when compared to David. But ultimately, it was not a sorrow which led to repentance. It was a sorrow which led to death. You see, true godly sorrow is a sorrow which does not stem from being caught or exposed, but from a realization that you have sinned against the almighty God. A sorrow that you have violated and rebelled against the holiness of God. A realization that you deserve in that instant to be swallowed up by the righteous anger of God against your whole sinful being. And a realization that you can never make things right with God on your own. That's the kind of sorrow that leads to repentance, which, which drives you not away from God, but towards God. Towards God, because you recognize that He is the only hope for forgiveness, He is the only hope for salvation, He is the only hope for you to find grace and mercy. And we can contrast Saul here with a future account that we will consider, Lord willing, when we get to 2 Samuel at some point in the future, when, Saul is, uh, when, when David is caught out, when David is confronted for having stolen Bathsheba in adultery, for having deceived and, and then murdered Uriah. And when David's sin is exposed, he cries out to God against you and against you only have I sinned. So as we come back to our myth this morning, we see that in Saul's case, sorrow over sin is not always a sign of true repentance. Saul's concern here was not for the the restoration of his soul. It was not for the glory of God. Saul's concern was not to be made right with God. Saul's concern here was really motivated, it seems, by one of self-preservation because we see that he gets David to make a covenant to him that David will not wipe out him or his family. No, true repentance is seen in a deep, Hatred of our sin at its core. As a violation, every sin that you and I commit is a violation against the holy character of God. And so true repentance is, is a desire to be made right with God at all costs. A, a complete turnaround from everything that we once loved, everything that we once pursued to now crave and desire in Jesus Christ, all those things that we used to hate. So as we expose this final myth to the word of God this morning, we see that it too is busted. Well, there we have three modern myths about Christianity exposed and demolished by the word of God. And all three myths challenge what we think about and how we respond to the promises of God. Do we really take God's word seriously? We considered this a few weeks ago. 
Do we always subject ourselves to the principles of God's word, even though an open door may present a shortcut to achieving our goals? Do we trust the goodness and the promises of God that he is working out all things for our good and for his glory? even when we are wrongly accused, even when we are sinned against and robbed and persecuted, do we seek to vindicate ourselves or do we lay ourselves and our enemies by faith in the perfect hands of God to deal with as he sees is best? And do we really believe what God's word says about sin? about our sin, about our total inability to ever please God through works of righteousness? Do we recognize the utter filthiness of our sins, which results in us being under the wrath of God and destined for eternal separation unless we truly repent? And so as I close today, can I encourage you not to look to David to be your example in these things, although we can learn principles from God's word in the life of David here. But I want to ask you this morning to look to David's great grandson, the Lord Jesus Christ, who when the devil came and presented Jesus an open door to gain all the kingdoms of the world on a silver platter, Jesus rejected that shortcut and chose instead to endure the cross. When Jesus was falsely accused and tried and sentenced to death for crimes which he never committed, he did not seek to, to vindicate himself. He did not exercise his rights as the Son of God. He did not try to clear his name. He handed himself over to the gracious will of God to do what was best for his enemies. And God sent Jesus to the cross. Where would you and I be today if Jesus had stood on his rights? Where would we be today if Jesus treated us like we so often treat each other? Where would we be today if Jesus had demanded to be vindicated? Where would we be today if Jesus had taken the shortcut? Now Jesus did all of this for you and me because of his great love. You and I have received grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy. And so may we never be like Saul who grieved over being caught for a short while, for being exposed, only to return a few days later like a dog back to its vomit. But let us truly this morning turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. And then as we receive from him this undeserving grace, that we may go out from here, from our homes, and that we would extend that same undeserving grace, that same forgiveness to those around us who have wronged us and sinned against us. This is God's way. This is God's good and pleasing and perfect will for you and for me this morning. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord God, we want to thank you again today for your word. Lord, we want to thank you that there is nothing new under the sun. And although we live in a world so very different to what we've read about Saul and David here this morning, so your word and the principles of your word cut through all the ages of history and apply directly to our hearts this morning. Lord, we thank you that your word has exposed three myths that we as Christians are so prone to to believe in. And we pray that as we realign our thinking today to the principles of your word, so we pray and ask that you would continue to renew our minds, to transform us from the inside out, that you would align our thinking and our desires and our actions to be that which is in accordance with your good and pleasing and perfect will. And Lord, where there are some today in the midst of our congregation
who have been wronged, who've been sinned against, who've been deeply hurt by others. Lord, won't you help them to learn the lessons from your word today that there is only great favor to be found in placing ourselves under the mighty hand of God, placing ourselves into your care for you to do what is right in each of our lives. And we pray that as we do that, that you would be glorified, that we would be a, a witness and a testimony to the world around us of, of who you are and of your undeserved grace and mercy and favor that is poured out on sinners like us and that this would even be able to draw our enemies to this desire for, for that same forgiveness and grace in their own lives. And so we, we thank you for your word and we pray that you would apply it to our hearts this morning. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to close our service this morning by singing uh, another uh, well-known old hymn, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And uh, as you may be feeling a little bit unsettled this morning by having to let go of some of these myths that have been busted this morning. May you find uh, your refuge on the solid rock, uh, which is Jesus Christ. And the Lord bless you in this week ahead. Amen.